Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our chapbook launch. Uh, so for anyone who's meeting us or our press for the first time, I'll just tell you a little bit about us. Jack Pine Press is based here in Saskatoon. We were founded in 2002, and for almost 20 years, we've helped poets and artists make weird, beautiful, handmade poetry chapbooks. We encourage collaboration and the sharing and learning of new skills, the intersection of artistic disciplines, and the exploration of what a book is permitted to be. Jack Pine Press receives support to do what we do from Sask Arts, and we'd like to extend our sincerest thanks to them tonight for making it possible for us to bring you this wonderful poetry and these beautiful books. Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for the launch of I Followed the Coasts by Tazzy Rodriguez. We're going to have some great fun tonight. Um, I'm Taya Grabeza. I'm one of the board members on Jack Pine Press and your host tonight. Um, so before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land that we are current, that Jack Pine is currently on um, and where I'm broadcasting from. Um, so we're coming together from all these different places and time zones today. Uh, and Jack Pine Press is located on Treaty 6 territory, the unceded territories of the Nihiawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Dene Nations, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And I'm currently tuning in from Treaty 4 territory uh, in Regina, Saskatchewan. Or, yeah. <laughs> we welcome audience engagement throughout the launch. So say hi in the chat, give some praise, ask your questions. Uh, just make sure to send it to everyone so everyone here can engage with each other and sort of uh, support Tazzy and her beautiful book. Um, there's also live captions tonight, and all you have to do to turn them on or off is click the live transcription icon at the bottom of the screen. There's two little CC icon as well, so just look for that. So I am thrilled to introduce our author tonight, uh, Tazzy Rodriguez. Tazzy Rodriguez is a writer and master's student in biology who studies movement and fresh water in both disciplines. In the summer of 2018, she was an assistant lighthouse keeper on the Porphyry Island, Lake Superior. From Winnipeg, she is currently based in Kingston, Ontario. Help me welcome Tazzy. Hello. Um, thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, thank you to Jack Pine for helping me make this book. Um, I'm reading from Kingston, which is where Lake Ontario flows into the St. Lawrence River. Um, this is Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory um, and Porphyry Island, which is where this book is, is centered, um, is also Anishinaabe land. Um, and I encourage you wherever you are to think about the water around you um, and your relationship with it and who else has had relationships with it and access to it. Um, and so to situate us on Porphyry Island, to ground us in that space, I'm going to start with the first poem in the book, which is called Point. Waves slip up the shore, tug gently back into the lake, mid-August, and the water mumbles at the base of the rock, only an echo of its November roar. Out on the water, a pair of loons laugh, then dip under when the sound recedes. The island calls back out softly, horsefly landing in grass, ant scurrying into succulents, gull feather tangled into ferns. A purple harebell tips her head into the wind, nestled into where the rock has cleaved. Every crevice becomes a cradle for little white spires, orange flowers, lichens, grasses, soft moss, encrusted saxifrage that folds out of the land, its edges rimmed as if embroidered. The loons resurface, laugh again, the murmurs of the lake more insistent now. The harebell leans forward, listening, water carving out its space, land pushing back, ants and spiders and flies returning home, loons. 
The giant pulls the sun across to the other side of the peninsula and down below his head, and this side of the island lies quiet, waiting, ready for light to reappear and dance against the shore. Um, a big part of my role on Porphyry Island as an assistant lighthouse keeper uh, was to give tours when visitors came to the island. And so I'm gonna try to weave that through my poems tonight. Um, the giant in that poem lies between Porphyry Island and Thunder Bay and is made of rock and is home of the Sleeping Giant Provincial Park. Um, so the cover of this book is the outline of the island. I'm going to need to orient myself to it in the Zoom screen. Um, so the Sleeping Giant is about here. Uh, and visitors coming to the island would come in through the harbor and then along a path this way um, to the point here that's the focus of, of that poem. Um, so I lived in a house in this encrusted saxifrage here. Uh, there we go. Um, and the point is quite interesting because it's Arctic disjunct. So when the glaciers receded across Lake Superior, um, that part of the island maintained Arctic species or what we now think of as Arctic species because it's so cold and surrounded by Lake Superior, um, which keeps it cold throughout the summer. Um, so that's a very, very interesting part of the island to me. Um, one of the other great things about leading tours on Porphyry was that I learned a lot about the island very quickly. I'd never been to the island before going there uh, to live there, um, nor had I been to Thunder Bay, um, and so which is the city closest. So the next poem I'm going to read uh, originally appeared in CB2 and is more about where I was coming from going to the island. It's called Prairie Girl. Spring folds into you by the creek, the land thawing slowly, each hour peeling back another film of winter. Bulrushes write themselves, preparing once again to topple in July. Geese fly back, stake their territory, recover the land they lent to frost. The creek cracks and opens up, water pushing up the banks and spring folds into you, watching from the trees, bare feet covered in mud. Later, you will follow this creek to river. From there to lake, you will land on the coasts of an island held in spring all summer long, learn its edges with your hands. From the lighthouse, the lake looks wide as the fields the creek runs through, the currents that pulled a prairie girl to sea. Um, this poem is on kind of a cream colored page next to a light blue page. And if you look at the book this way, you can see kind of um, that it moves from dark blue to light blue to cream and then back again. Um, yeah, like this. Um, and this is uh, an attempt at echoing um, the light of Porphyry Island. So all of the lighthouses around Thunder Bay flash at different intervals. I think Porphyry flashes every seven seconds, but if somebody knows for sure um, and can correct me, I'm open to that. Um, yeah, so, but them flashing at different intervals helps to identify when you're on the lake, uh, what lighthouse you're near. Um, and so that's what we're trying to pull in with the three colors of paper. Um, the next poem I am going to read is on light blue paper, and it's called Wind Speed. The light tower sings in the wind, each note reverberating up the stairs. The wind is 20 knots, strong enough for waves to crest over the tip of the island, for the tower to become a boat and you cradled within it. You came up to watch the waves, the trees, the raspberry bushes just ripening now at the end of August. This here is your world, where you learned the names of all the islands, how to keep the red paint from getting everywhere, where you memorized the phyla of every Arctic plant. Stop saying small boat or catamaran, call them 16 footers and cats, you can eyeball 20 knots, where you, prairie girl, 
girl from the city, listened to waves push against rocks while the stars came out, more than you had ever imagined, and they danced to the tides with you. Like this island, your coasts have been shaped by the waves. Tonight, you'll go down to the docks, invited onto a boat for drinks. Next week, you'll be walking down Boulevard Saint Laurent, city girl returned to the city, and you will realize you had forgotten the smell of exhaust. Duck into a cafe and drink strong coffee that tastes like the island. But right now, the light tower is singing, each note moving through your body, your whole world stretches against horizon, expanding and collapsing with every wave that reaches shore. You imagine you can see the encrusted saxifrage from here. Um, I'm gonna read one more poem. So along with a lot of tea and coffee on the island, we also ate a lot of uh, rhubarb, mayonnaise and peaches. Um, so I'm gonna read a newer poem that missed the boat for being included in the book um, that talks a bit about how groceries arrived. It's called Groceries Arrive at the Light Station. Peaches bruised against the hull of the Zodiac, welted in the cardboard box delivered each week to the island, sweetened sugars peeled from skin. We diced them into crumble, ate richly on Mondays and Tuesdays, made coleslaw for every other meal. The pantry was lined with cabbages and canned pea soup. We never ordered peaches, perhaps they were on sale. At the tide pools, the ones that were iron tinted, we watched tiny insects twist their way to surface. I didn't know their names yet, called everything boatmen. Otherwise, we were quiet. Those poems are just such a lovely way to sort of really just wave us into this launch. And I just felt, I don't even have words. I just have icons of just hearts, you know, just flashing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I, I really loved the line in, um, I think it was the, just the poem before you read this last one. Um, like this island, your coasts have been shaped by these waves. I was just like, oh. That's like a line that you sit with for like a few minutes and be like, hmm. <laughs> Thank you. So, so for this part of the launch, for all the folks here with us is we're going to do a little uh, question and answer period. So a little interview. Um, so while I'm conversing with Tazzy, we welcome audience questions. So just post them in the chat and I will get to them. Um, so I guess to begin, Tazzy, I was wondering, since you mentioned that, you know, you're a master's student in biology. Um, so I was wondering if you can tell us about how your research in that area informs your poems, and then maybe later talk about um, how maybe those also informed how you thought to design the book. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm a first year master's student right now. Uh, when I was on Porphyry, I was between my first and second year of undergrad. Um, so I think being a biology student has impacted my writing that whole time, but in different ways. Um, so I'll answer, I'll answer first about now, then about, then about the book. Um, certainly since starting grad school a few months ago, I've noticed that being in that headspace of research and of biology research has, has had a huge impact on my writing, uh, my creative writing. Uh, for one thing, I've started to include citations in my poems, um, hopefully in a way that still makes them accessible to people who might not have that study that I'm citing in front of them, or even people who aren't as familiar with the terminology, but um, I've definitely started drawing more directly um, from, from research and from studies that I encounter. Um, and then also I think that for me, being a master's student has been a space where I've had a lot of time dedicated to thinking very deeply and untangling um, different scientific ideas. And I think that's also translated into my poetry. Uh, when I came back to the poems and I followed the coast, I was really surprised 
that they're so short. Um, one of them I think is four lines and I've been writing like four page long poems uh, recently. And I think it's that same kind of thing of um, because I'm spending my days thinking very intensely of uh, scientific ideas, I'm kind of bringing that to my poetry too and kind of more interested in untangling ideas than I think I was when writing I Followed the Coasts. But I think you can definitely see uh, in these poems in the chapbook um, that they're written by somebody who is becoming a biologist. Um, I think there's a lot of impact, a lot of attention to all sorts of different organisms, humans and other. Um, and I could see a lot of the threads of kind of like ways of writing about, about the environment that I'm thinking about now sort of starting to form um, in the chapbook. In terms of the design, um, I'm going to show a diagram um, of a butterfly that's in the book. Um, and so I think definitely in this in this illustration, there are a few illustrations that accompany the, the poems, um, and some of them are quite schematic. And I think that's because I think in diagrams sometimes and was looking at a lot of plots and graphs and um, yeah, so I think it had an impact on the design in that way. That's really wonderful. I'm I'm so interested in in how in I followed the coast. It seems like you're pulling from the design aspect and also sort of you're becoming into your sort of personhood of, of a biologist and sort of using those ways to to connect. And then now your your research and connecting now to to citations is another way to sort of um, draw people to different things and another way of communicating, which I think is really interesting. Uh, I'm excited to see what you come come with out with next and how um, maybe we'll have a diagram poem somewhere. <laughs> That's really lovely. Um, so I while we're getting some questions uh, built up in the chat, I'm going to ask another one of mine. <laughs> Um, how does the theme of liminal spaces fit in the setting of I Followed the Coasts? A coast is an in-between space and the lighthouse as a symbol embodies both light and dark. Uh, so could you talk about the importance of those ideas in your work? Yeah, um, I think that that's something I was definitely thinking about more on the island than I am now. Um, probably not coincidentally because of, of what you've just talked about in terms of coastal spaces. Um, and yeah, the liminal space of, of light and dark and also I think the dissonance between a lighthouse is kind of a beacon that you want to be attracted to, but also a warning not to go anywhere near it because there are rocks or whatever it's warning about. Um, so that was definitely very present in my thinking. Um, yeah, on the island. I think that maybe one of the ways that it comes through also um, is that liminal spaces are maybe places where things get lost more often uh, because they're not attached to like land or water. Um, I think I probably felt that as a lighthouse keeper kind of intricately tied to boats into the nautical world that was going on around me, but at the time I couldn't operate a boat. So I was definitely not in that space, but I also wasn't really fully on land. Um, and so I think I was really drawn to like, what is being lost in this middle space? Um, and also the lighthouse is a very transient space, not the lighthouse itself, not the island itself. It's an island that stays put, but um, the stories moving through it and the people moving through it are often not there for very long. And then they go, you know, like with me to Kingston. Um, and so I think that's part of why I wanted to put it together into a chat book to think about like what was in those liminal spaces that I could pull out and kind of hope not get lost. Mm -hmm. I Yeah, I love what you have to say about, about getting lost in that liminal space. And, and it's interesting too that in some of my own sort of research about liminal spaces, it's also a space of transformation. So I mm -hmm. think that's really interesting in, in connection to um, what your book is doing and, and what you're doing and sort of how all of these are sort of coexisting together. Um, yeah, really cool. Uh, so in the chat, um, Betty asks, Tazzy, now that you've had some time from your summer on Porphyry, 
What images do you recall most vividly? That's a good question. Um, also, I hope you don't mind Betty. Betty was one of the artists in residence when I was uh, on the light on the island. Um, and I think that, that her work drew me towards some visual images. Um, but I'm going to try not to think too deeply about that or I won't be able to answer the question. Um, there's a, an area of the island um, that we would canoe to, uh, but you can also walk. That's kind of around a bend. And I think that's the place that I often come back to uh, when I think about the island. It's an area that not as many passersby um, would go to or like short stay visitors. Um, and yeah, I think the images there of, of cedar roots and of tide pools, um, it, yeah, that's a place that I definitely come back to visually. Cool. That's so nice that, that someone who inspired you is also here. And uh, I love seeing that connection at these launches. Um, another question from the chat, are you integrating creative writing or art more generally into your research as well? I don't think so, but maybe I should be. Um, hmm. No, not yet. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think there's, there's definitely like a visual communication aspect that I'm thinking a lot about. Um, in the opposite direction, I'm really interested in writing poetry and code right now. I haven't done any of it, but I'm interested in doing it um, because I write a lot of code for my research. Um, and so I think that's a way in which more directly it would go together. Um, but I think at least at the stage where I'm at, where I'm starting the data analysis for the projects that I'm working on, um, it's a little hard to pull creative work into it. Um, but I'm definitely looking forward to exploring more of the intersections. Um, and I think in science communication, that's probably a good avenue too for, for looking at how to integrate art and research um, to, yeah, maybe not just visual art, but in general um, to communicate to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. That'd be a really interesting project. It, it seems like your research is more um, influencing your creative work right now. And it'll be really cool to see if down the line, it sort of art <laughs> infiltrates science in that way as well. Um, that's really awesome. Okay, another question or maybe just comment. Let me just, <laughs> uh, really interested in the connection between getting lost and the lighthouse as a way to keep those from getting lost. Great connections, okay. Very good, uh, a, a good comment. Um, <laughs> and, and some more praise. Ah, the poet is someone who wants to keep things from getting lost. So good. Oh, that's such a nice reading. Thanks, Rilla. <laughs> I think that's lovely. Um, well, I will let people continue thinking and ask one of my questions that I've been waiting to ask you. Um, so, there's a lot of affection for the characters and the poems about those on Porphyry Island. How much of your writing experience was about holding memories and were there things you wished you could write about but didn't fit into the poems? I am really glad that affection came through um, in these poems. Um, yeah, and I really like what you said about holding memories. I think that that was a big part of what I wanted to do. Um, I, before and after living at the lighthouse, I lived in the middle of Montreal, and I think part of wanting to put the book together into a book um, was to have kind of a tactile way to have a more material sense of these memories and be able to look at them or not look at them um, and to engage with them on a more physical level when I was in a place that was totally different, also an island, but a very different island. Um, in terms of things that I wish had been in the book, I think that it's 
complete as it is for what it is. I think that the stories that are in it are what I wanted to do, which was to have kind of a way of documenting that summer. Um, one of the great things about living on Porphyry and giving tours was that the tours were very often reciprocal. Um, so I had like some education about the island. I knew minute to minute what was going on that summer, but people would come who had known the old lighthouse keepers or grown up at a different lighthouse um, or like knew a lot about the plants. And we would have a lot of exchange of information, which I think was really wonderful. Um, and so some of those stories are maybe other people's to share if they want. And some of them, I don't think I will translate ever into creative work, but there are definitely things that I'm coming back to now, I think just with a bit more space and a bit more time um, and different lenses. One, one concrete example of that is that as part of this job, I worked very briefly on the Alexander Henry Museum ship, uh, who lives in Thunder Bay right now, used to be an icebreaker. Um, and I wanted to write about the Alexander Henry, but I couldn't figure out how. And then I moved to Kingston. I was walking along Lake Ontario one day and I passed by the Maritime Museum and I suddenly remembered that the Alexander Henry used to live here in Kingston, the Maritime Museum, which had meant nothing to me when I was there because I didn't have any connection to Kingston. But I think that sort of thing of just like having a bit more space um, is also giving me new lenses. And so I think I'm coming back to Porphyry a bit right now, probably also because I've been binding the book. So it's been on my mind. Um, but yeah, there are some stories that are coming out now. That's so lovely. It's so funny how, how these things happen with books after we sort of finish them, but then there's still these stories that keep coming, like the waves that keep coming in uh, on the shore. Um, awesome. <laughs> uh, so a question from the chat, um, how has your thinking about land and relation to land developed in your writing in the time since I followed the coasts? Um, quite a lot and also every day. So I don't know <laughs> how to answer this question because it's going to be different tomorrow. Um, but that's somewhere also where I think research and being an aquatic researcher has really tied into my writing um, because I've been thinking so much about how to be an aquatic researcher who's also a second generation settler who doesn't have a lot of ancestral relationship with this land or any land. Um, and so I've been thinking about that a lot in the context of being a biologist um, and that's impacted how I'm writing. Um, I don't know if there are any like big pieces that I can tease apart right now in terms of how that's developed since writing I Follow the Coasts, um, I think I'm thinking a lot more about non-human uh, beings um, and entities and how they work in my poetry um, and how in my research, I'm thinking a lot about fish as research partners. Um, I'm not, I haven't really thought specifically as, about fish as creative collaborators yet, but um, I probably should. Maybe that's coming next. Um, yeah, so I think there are things like that that are just slowly developing and, and things that I am thinking a lot about as a biologist and as a poet and about my responsibility as somebody who has, because of those roles, kind of this position of being a storyteller um, and of people listening to my stories sometimes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would really like to hear anybody's input on that if they have any or talk to anyone about it. Yeah, I, I really admire your, um, your answer to, to that question of it changes every day. And, and that's so true. Um, and, and I am fascinated in hearing um, about how someone with your background relates to the land uh, in comparison to someone like me who, who doesn't have that background and, and how I'm learning to sort of um, connect to the land and, and sort of learn about it and, and, and that sort of thing. So lots of learning tonight, which I'm so grateful for. <laughs> That's the best part of this job <laughs> or <laughs> position is I get to learn so much and talk to such smart people <laughs> uh, like yourself. Um, 
So before I embarrass myself too much on camera, <laughs> I'll move on to uh, another question in the chat. Um, so how long did you live at the lighthouse? Two months, um, which is kind of unbelievable when I think about it. Um, yeah, it wasn't a very long time, but I think lighthouses are a very intense space. And so it had an oversized impact on my life. Um, because that's where I was in a way that I'm not like in Kingston necessarily 24 um, seven. You know, sometimes my mind wanders to other places, but I was very concentratedly, uh, yeah, on the island for two months. Time becomes so different when you sort of think about it like that. Hey, it's like not very long, but that was so, has such an impact on you. That's so wonderful. Um, so another question, what is your vision for poetry written in code? How would it thematically differ from traditional English poetry? Um, I have kind of two ideas about this, but they're both in like not even generative stages yet, like very, very small ideas. Uh, one of them is that I think it would be interesting to play with um, words that I use to code um, not within the structure of code, but use the same, um, yeah, the same words and be limited by that constraint, maybe, but in different, different organizations and strictly writing and functions. Um, but then the other thing that I think could be really interesting is using functions and using like generative aspects of code, um, to create poetry. I have no idea where that's going, but there are people who are doing a lot of poetry like that, um, whose names I do not know off the top of my head, but I recommend looking into it if you're interested. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Um, and a lot of opportunity too for, for visual poetry as well, if you're ever interested in that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, so, uh, Another question, uh, Tazzy, has, your, has writing poetry for you always been tied to your scientific slash natural slash geographic interests or did the two interests emerge separately and then merge? And if separately, which one first? They have not always been tied together. I decided I wanted to be a field biologist when I was in kindergarten. And I think when I was in kindergarten, I also did my first reading. Um, I was very, very shy. And then I suddenly appeared on the stage at the Children's Museum uh, doing a reading, I think, if I get that story right. I don't have a firsthand memory of it. Um, and then also I went to the Manitoba Museum and I saw an exhibit on chimpanzees and decided I wanted to be a field biologist. So I guess they emerged at the same time. Um, but took very different paths. And I didn't really think about them being together um, for a long time. And I think that's also something that even though I did, I did my undergrad in biology, I think even that has come out more since I've been in grad school and been in more of a research headspace um, where my poetry has really shifted to all being about lakes. <laughs> Everyone in the chat loves this story of you in kindergarten being <laughs> on stage. <laughs> That's so great. Um, okay, I think this is a comment, but it does speak to what you've sort of been saying about, um, well, in your answers. So I'll read it to you uh, from Betty. Uh, Tazzy, with your poetry, you're extending something you did on the island when illuminating us on the lives and tide pools, making the invisible visible. Yeah, I think that's really interesting that you're sort of um, giving us uh, those things. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that or just sort of be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, thank you, Betty. Um, there are a lot of invertebrates in the tide pools and there are more and more invertebrates in my writing. Um, I think for that exact reason that I want to pull that out. Um, also, I am going to take the opportunity of, of 
uh, answering Betty to say that there are also three other artists in residence. Um, when I was on the lighthouse, so um, Betty, Cynthia No, Adrian Brooks, and Kaya Savanan in Mountain, they are all listed in the acknowledgments of I Follow the Coasts, but also um, they are all amazing artists and they also illuminated various things on the island. So that was also really cool to be able to interact with people um, in that way and with other artists in that way. Community is so important and connections. Um, so another question in the chat. Thanks for thanks everyone for for posting in the chat. It it it's so delightful to have this conversation. Um, so Tazzy, do you ever feel that language is insufficient to capture the experience um, or reality of fish, water, land, etc.? Hmm. Yes. Um, first of all, I think particularly my language, like I, I am totally limited to what I'm able to translate of my experiences of land and water and fish. Um, maybe particularly for the fish, I have no idea what it's like to be a fish. Um, and so I think, but also with land and water, we need as many, as many voices possible, as many experiences possible, talking in language, but also um, language is limiting. And another thing that I've been interested in, other than writing poems and code, is also integrating more multimedia into my writing. Um, I use acoustic signals to study fish. Um, so I don't study soundscapes, but I yeah, position fish with acoustic signals. Um, and that's made me really interested in drawing more music into my writing. Um, and then thinking also about like cultures of music and water and connections there. Um, and then that's kind of opened my brain to think about all sorts of different multimedia ways of thinking about land and water and fish and other things that live in the water. Um, if anybody wants to make any art with me in a multimedia way, please let me know. I would be so happy. I am limited by my ability to do things in other media. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to interact in different ways, especially because those are such multi-sensory experiences. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential to have discussions with different senses than just whatever you're engaging with language. Mm -hmm. Totally. I think I speak for everyone that we all would love to, to hear any of this sort of musical um, things that you probably eventually will create. Um, I don't have any music talent, so I can't offer. <laughs> if you need a paper artist though, oh. I'm your girl. <laughs> um, but this conversation about water and land sort of leads into a question I had that, um, that I wanted to ask. Uh, in your bio, you talked about the importance of water in your writing, and, and that's another underlying theme of I Followed the Coasts. So could you speak more to uh, what it is about the water that keeps you inspired, um, I guess, in addition to literally everything else you've said tonight? <laughs> um, yeah, I can answer this question for hours, but I will not. Um, yeah, I think water is really interesting in and of itself. Um, like as a solvent that has all sorts of things dissolved in it, as something that shapes landscapes, um, as a medium that connects people. I think like water alone is super interesting, but water as a home is even more interesting. Um, and yeah, there are fish, there are, there are zooplankton, amphibians, algae, um, there's so much going on um, in water. And so I think from a writing perspective, um, I'm pretty sure there's nothing that can't be written about through a lens of water. I'm testing this right now. Um, I've been really <laughs> pushing what I can write about um, through the lens of water, but I think things keep coming up. Like um, last summer I worked on a, as a field assistant for microplastic study and I was working with amphibians. And so that brought up 
a whole new slew of questions um, that I hadn't been thinking about in my in my normal fish thoughts. Um, yeah, so I, I think I think it's really limitless in terms of what you can write about. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And like water as like symbol and, and motif too. Like it's just, I think you'll be writing about water for the rest of your life. <laughs> Um, someone in the chat uh, is one wants to know more about how fish hear. Do, do you have any um, <laughs> answers? Or <laughs> um, I don't think I can answer this in a satisfying way. I study fish movement predominantly, um, so yeah, I put little tags in fish that. Well, I haven't yet, but I use data from tags that are in fish that ping out acoustic signals. This is how I use acoustic signals in my work, and then that's how you can track them. Fish do have a really cool uh, lateral line, which is a sensory organ that goes all the way down their bodies um, that allows them to sense more than we can with our concentrated sensory abilities. Um, but I, I really need to work on my fish physiology. So <laughs> I don't know how to just finding other sources to back me up on that. I'm going to echo John in the chat. That answer is more than <laughs> satisfactory. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, and Rilla says, I'm learning so much. And honestly, yes, this has been so educational and so fascinating. Now I'm going to like go and just like do a lot of reading about fish and like water. And <laughs> um, so as a sort of uh, last question, unless I get some more in the chat, um, I was wondering if you wanted to, to speak to what your favorite design element for the book was and what did you enjoy most about creating it uh, and and if there was any challenges yeah um so probably my favorite part in terms of how it came out was also the most challenging um which is the binding mm -hmm. so yeah i originally wanted to do um saddle stitching for the binding uh but jack pine suggested a stab stitch binding I'm not sure, I don't know enough about the history to know if this is any part of the intention, but what I really like about the binding um, is that it's very ropey. Like you can see the thread on the inside. You can see, oh, not really as much on this copy, but kind of, you can see that, uh, not at all on the screen. There's a knot, there's a visible knot um, and there's visible thread on the outside and there's a lot of rope and knots on boats. Um, so I like that it has that that tie. Um, it was very challenging because I am not a very skilled bookbinder, or at least a very trained bookbinder. Um, so I don't know if there's a more efficient way to do this, but I made the holes in the body of the book, the binding holes here, then I did them for the front cover, then I did them for the back cover, then I sewed it up, and I did that dozens of times. Um, it was a very interesting experience because I had to be so physically careful with the books. Um, and it had been a long time since I read the poems. Uh, this process was interrupted by the first year and a bit of the pandemic. Um, so I was coming back to them after a while and I had to like really sit with them and be really physically careful with them. And it was interesting to, to do that. I don't often do that with older work. Um, so yeah, that was an interesting experience. I also really liked doing the illustrations. I did the inside illustrations mostly at Cafe Aunja in Montreal, drinking really good tea. And then I did the cover illustration in Hungry Hall, the dining hall of the Experimental Lakes area, also drinking really good tea. So that was just like a fun experience of taking my time drawing and drinking tea. <laughs> Nothing like good tea to make <laughs> life better, honestly. <laughs> That's really cool. And I, I'm sure that, that Amy being the, the book expert that she is, probably had that inkling about the binding. Um, so that's really cool how it just like naturally tied into the book. Um, so those that wanna see those ropey binding, order a book. <laughs> um, so we have one other question in the chat, or two now. <laughs> so we'll ask these and then um, maybe we will, uh, go into your reading to close off the evening. Um, so what made you switch 
wanting to study primates to studying fish. How did the prairie girl fall in love with the water? Um, so I went to a school for the last two years of high school on the West Coast. And when I was figuring out where I wanted to go for this school, there were a few options. Um, I wanted to go to the one closest to the water. So I think I knew in that decision process that I wanted to be near water, but I don't know why I hadn't connected it yet to field biology, because it's much more practical than studying chimpanzees for a Canadian. Um, but as part of that program, I had to do a research project. We were told not to do it in biology, but I did it in biology anyway. And I studied Lake Winnipeg. I studied cyanobacteria on Lake Winnipeg or blue-green algae. It was a terrible research project um, in terms of like scientific rigor and quality, but it made me so much more aware of aquatic sciences, of freshwater sciences in particular, also like a lot of the cultural questions around water that I was interested in exploring further. Um, so that's, that's the project that converted me um, very specifically that, that, uh, yeah. Um, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is that there is a lot of water on the prairies and Manitoba is kind of a coastal province. Um, so there, yeah, there's that aspect too. There is, there is a lot of water on the prairies and I think that we often forget that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's such a good answer. Thank you. Um, and so our last question is, Tazzy, thinking about approaching the natural world through both scientific and creative lenses simultaneously, is, was there a formative poet or nature writer for you both as a reader and a writer? Hmm. Um. I have many answers to this. The first I think is that the reason I wanted to become a primatologist and study chimpanzees was partly because of the books of Dr. Jane Goodall. Um, part of it was also her exhibit at the Manitoba Museum, um, but very early reading books um, by Jane Goodall was part of that. So that was formative very early on. From a more academic perspective, um, I've really been enjoying reading the work of Dr. Zoe Todd, who's a fish philosopher. I really recommend everyone read. Um, and yeah, there are so, so many books, especially about water, um, that I, I don't know, maybe I'll compile a list of suggestions at some point because there aren't singular names that are really coming, but I think that it's such a big body of, of work um, and something that I'm really trying to immerse myself in right now to figure out kind of where I situate myself um, and also to figure out what conversations are going on um, and learn from them. I'm just looking at my computers up on a stack of books. So I'm looking to see, uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, um, I think just generally the whole body of, of literature about water is super interesting. Mm -hmm. Totally. Also, I have been there with like a stack of books trying to get like the right <laughs> angle <laughs> for presentations. That's excellent. Um, but can, so thank you so much, Tazzy, for this illuminating interview. Um, and I'm sure I and our audience really have well learned a lot and also have just everything you've been saying has been resonating a lot um, with me and with folks in the chat, which, which we'll send to you and you can see all the nice things. Um, but could, can I invite you to, to read more for us? Yeah, um, thank you so much for all of the, all of the really thoughtful questions. Um, I'm feeling a lot more relaxed now. I, because it's been a, been, been a pandemic, I haven't done any readings in a very long time. So this is a bit funny to have my reintroduction to doing a reading being a one hour book launch. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna read four more poems again. Um, I'm going to start with 
um, a poem called Sea Lion Necropsy. This is a shorter version of the whole because uh, it's one of the really long, unwieldy poems that I've been working on lately. Um, this poem partly takes place at a different lighthouse off of the West Coast. Um, and it also talks about a sea lion necropsy, which is like an autopsy, but for somebody who's not human. Um, so just a heads up that I describe a sea lion necropsy. She washed up on the sand like this, body straight as decking, head drifting somewhere out at sea. Behind her, at the Weir's Beach RV park, visitors drew their blinds when we arrived for the necropsy. You sliced through her muscle, knife glinting against its lemon handle in the sun, pulled back flesh like stage curtains, sunk your blue gloved hands into her abdomen, reached among her stomach and her spleen. February morning smelled like moss and mud and blood and the long reach of saline into land. Inside, the sea lion was pomegranate red, entrails sections like seeds, fur chapped by salt and sand. The tide receded. We pulled out her guts, coiled them like rigging, then stretched intestines all the way down the beach, more than 50 meters, past driftwood, past long ribbons of kelp washed ashore, past the whole length of the RV park. The summer before she died, we had gone to the lighthouse, to the island between here and Port Angeles, where elephant seals rolled into the door of our salt-speckled house, water raced between the rocks. We scraped Coast Guard paint from old wooden railings, applied new color, surveyed the intertidal. At the outer edges of this tiny archipelago, all the pinnipeds slid into the strait. Near the tower, there's a patch of dirt where one keeper's family tried to garden, asked for soil to be brought on the supply ship though the trees became skeletal in the wind. Down the coast, they found a fossilized sea lion skeleton covered in barnacles, layers upon layers upon layers. The bones on the beach with us weren't, weren't showing yet, body still bloated, ribs still braced by flesh while you pried out the lungs. Arbutuses, 11 nautical miles from the lighthouse, were shored up by land. Strawberry anemones ring around the lighthouse intertidal. That summer, we watched the bend of barnacle, kelp bulb sea lions rippling as they sunned. On land, they barreled into each other in slow motion, called to the rest of the colony while days rolled by, then dove to swallow squid and anchovies, bodies limber as bull kelp in the waves before hauling out again. On the beach, we washed the knife then dissecting scissors, cleaned her organs with a pail of ocean water poured into the slit down her side, rolled intestines back into her body. I held her heart in both my palms. With your hands, you traced the path of blood, vena cava, atria, tricuspid valve, mesentery filled with wind, veins thick against translucent membrane. The tide flowed in, reached back to her body, reddened in the sand. Um, I'm going to read another poem that's kind of West Coasty and then come back to Porphyry. Um, but one of the interesting things about plants on Porphyry Island is that there's a plant called Devil's Club, which exists on the West Coast and on Porphyry and then in very few other places. So it may have come as a gift or it may have come accidentally to the island. Um, and it has leaves that give a really um, bad rash. So there's a patch of it by the path on Porphyry. If you ever go there, beware. Um, but yeah, that's a, a lighthouse tour plant fact. Uh, this is secondary succession. It's kind of about a West Coast forest, uh, but it mostly takes place on a page. Imagine the way the moss takes over, digs its claws into the paper, moves across this poem like shards of light, its rhizoids, a thousand flares against bone, dulling when evening sinks into the dirt. A non vascular plant, mosses ground themselves with hair-like structures we call rhizoids. In dusk, I bet it softens into creamy sheen. I bet it tastes sweet. Sweet like the nectarines that will one day emerge from the moss's forest body. Who am I kidding? Nectarines require well-drained soil. Sweet like the pears that will one day drape from the trees. But first come the rhizoids and then the roots, and they need fire to seal themselves to earth. So imagine the tinny takeover, 
the metal taste on tongue that comes before cobbler. Fire mosses mitigate soil erosion, but do not set a forest on fire. Tree roots also mitigate soil erosion. Don't set this poem on fire either. Soon grasses will grow between the bryophytic cracks, bend toward light, crane their necks as if they don't still have infinite sun. That will come later. The shrubs, then trees, broad and tall and their endless planks of shade. Imagine the hair of light landing on this line, pulling each word from soil. By then, the moss will be soft and will visit. Take a detour from the hike we plan to watch its endless clotted green, Ceratodon purpureus, Funaria hygrometrica, Prunus persica, Varnusa persica. There is nowhere this forest would grow except here. The moss will be soft, but the pears will be just short of ripe and will incise ourselves into them, into this forest built from yielding, from burning, from paper slowly turning in on itself like a snail. All right, I'm going to read two more poems um, that are poor free poems from the book. Um, the first one is called Dissection. When you're a biology student on a remote island, maybe elsewhere as well, um, people bring you bodies of animals that they find around the island. Um, I'm not really sure why, but this is, this is an homage to those animals. And it's also, um, Every time I read about it, I, I remember a woman who uh, lived at a nearby lighthouse. She negotiated a lease directly with the Coast Guard, which is not very typical. Um, and in her time at the lighthouse, she wasn't a lighthouse keeper. She just lived there and she collected many things. This is also a poem about collections. She starts collecting carcasses, a butterfly when the monarchs fall, its wings crunch at her touch, a fish, its skin already gutted of organs, scales drifting to the surface of a lake famous for not returning her dead. She keeps the frog in the clothespin box until it, is, it has dried out enough to draw, stays up by candlelight even after the summer sun sets, holds her lover with frog limp hands. Dragonfly wings, mosquito heads. She tallies eye color but does not keep their tiny bodies. Only the frog and butterfly remain by her bed slowly coming apart at all of their seams. Um, thank you everybody so much for, for coming. Um, I'm gonna close on that tiny little poem I talked about earlier. It's called Into the Land. It's six lines, not four lines. You sink slowly into the land, grab fistfuls of peat moss, shake black sand from your souls. When I return, I trace your outline on the mottled bark of cedar trees, climb into their boughs. Oh, what a beautiful poem to end on. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Tazzy. Um, and for reading and for, you know, giving us all this wonderful information that I'm sure all of us will, will hold somewhere close to our hearts, you know? Um, I certainly will be thinking about tonight for the for the rest of the week. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you to our audience who came out and, and enjoyed this launch with us. Go buy Tazzy's book. Um, it's beautiful. You won't regret it. And it'll be something to turn to um, in your future. Uh, and, and I just want to say before we say our goodbye that a recording of this launch will be a, available after the event on Jack, Jack Pine Press's YouTube channel, try to say that 10 times fast, um, <laughs> to rewatch or share. Uh, and you can purchase, of course, I Follow the Coasts on Jack Pine's website. So have a great evening, everyone.